Hey guys, this is Lego Master 99 er today, or Duncan, and today we are, or no, not, well, okay. Today we are going to be programming the, um, the Fibonacci sequence into our Redstone computer. Now this video is designed to be an add-on to the main um, tutorial that I've uploaded, or hopefully should have uploaded by the time this comes out. So I will just cut to the chase and get right to it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and reference my manual here. Alright, so I have decided that I'm going to go ahead and program this um, Fibonacci program on Core 2 here. So I will go ahead and clear um, the, the program memory here, and then I'll meet you guys back. Okay guys, I am back, and the program memory here has been completely cleared. And before we start the actually programming the, Fibon the Fibonacci program, I might as well explain to you what it is. Um, if you haven't seen the original video uh, showcasing this computer, it's basically the Fibonacci program is basically where um, it adds the previous two numbers that were added and then puts them on the screen. So then it would be 0 plus 1, which is 1, 1 plus 1, which is 2, 2 plus 1, which is 3, 3 plus 2, which is 5, 5 plus 3, 8, 8 plus 5, 13, so on and so forth. And I've decided that I'm going to go ahead and, as I said earlier, use Core 2 for this. And I'm going to be programming uh, the, the same program that is in the Redstone computer doc that is in the world download of the video. Oops. Looks like I, oh, I think this is Core 1. Yeah, okay, so Core 2 is down here. Okay, right, so this should be clear. All right. So yeah, as I, as I was saying, I'm, um, I'm going to be programming the same program that is in the doc that is in the world download. So without anything further ado, let's get started. All right, so for line one of code, it says we want to write zero to RAM address one. So we're gonna go ahead and write, as you were looking here at our um, bit values. So we wanna write one to RAM address one, as this is the RAM write bus, and we're gonna go ahead and write one. Oh, sorry, zero. We're writing zero to RAM address one, just basically clearing that address. And then, um, as in the uh, tutorial video, the general tutorial video for this, we will do the instructions first and then the go-to. So, all right, so next line of code, we're going to write 1 to RAM address 2. So RAM address 2 is here, and then we're going to be writing a 1. All right, now RAM address 3, we're going to go ahead and read RAM address 1 and output the decimal display. So this is read 1, I think, if we go and look here. Yep, that's 1. And I do realize now that this program could have been massively optimized, but um, this was a while ago and I kind of wasn't really thinking about optimizations too much in terms of the program. So I'm just going to basically be copying and showing you guys how to um, write the code that's, that's exactly in the, um, exactly at, like, like it is in the doc. And if you guys see optimizations and things that you want to do or change, just make them. And then, so this step can be actually completely completely skipped, but I'm gonna do it because it says it in the in the doc here. So we're gonna go ahead and read RAM address one and output the decimal display. So I think IO output is IO code nine. Let's go ahead and check. No, that's not the right bus. It's over here. Here it is. Uh, let's take a look here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. IO output. Okay, and. Um, before I continue, um, what is it? Uh, in the doc, it says that the IO output function is only available on Core 2, I think. Um, that is incorrect. Um, as when I finished the computer, I had added the um, required hardware to make it possible so that all four cores were able to um, use the IO output command. So just ignore that um, message. That's uh, Ignore that um, thing that's on the, the doc there. Sorry about that. But all right, so I know the operations ID for this um, instruction here is one for the decimal display. And now we're going to go ahead and go to line four, which is the main loop. I'm going to go ahead and read away, um, no, not read, add RAM address one and RAM address two. Then you're going to go ahead and enable dual read mode. So I'll enable dual read mode. And then I think this is one. This is 16. Okay. So there is an error by me. As you can see, the bit codes are different here, I think. So one, two, four. And then I think up here it might be different. Uh, yeah, see, one is on this side, two, four, eight, sixteen. That's part of the reasons why I wanted to, um, what is it, program on this core. And for the rest of these tutorial videos that I'll be doing, that I'll be um, uploading, 
and publishing. Um, I'll be doing trying to program programs to all the different cores so that you guys will be able to see how to program on all the different cores because they aren't all exactly the same. Um, they all are programmed exactly the same. Like, um, uh, what is it like? They all they all can do the same things, but the way to program is slightly different. So on core two, one is on this side here, as um, indicated by the sign here. So for nine, it'll be like this. So then one is here and eight is here instead of one being here and then eight being here. That would on this core be opcode 18, which does not exist. All right, and now actually let me just check that. Okay, so this is one. So you want to make sure to check your um, bit values here, and that's why they're indicated in the signs, so that if they're different on different cores, which I know is a kind of bad architectural design, um, uh, what is it? Um, you, you'll know to do that. So make sure to always check your bit signs here. That's the lesson of that. So we're going to go ahead and enable dual dual read mode, and this side will always be dual read mode, I think. Yep, always dual read mode. So the only part that's different is just, just make sure to check your check your signs in general. All right, so add is opcode one, so we're gonna place it over here, and then we're gonna go ahead and read RAM address one and RAM address two. Since we have dual read mode on, this becomes our second read. So we're adding one RAM address one and RAM address two, which, um, if we paid attention to the first couple lines of code. Uh, they should have the value zero and one in in those uh, um, those RAM addresses. All right, so now that is that instruction complete. For the next instruction, we are going to go ahead and write output to RAM one and output the decimal display. So we will go ahead and write to RAM one, which is over here. And remember, we we are able to write immediately after the add com uh, instruction because the data. Um, is saved in the core output register, which is, which basically means that the data will remain on the master output bus, which means you can do whatever you want with it using other commands until you issue a flush um, flush register command, and then it'll clear that for the next operation. So let's see here, where were we? This is not the right core. Good that we knew that. Okay, so here, this is the right instruction. We're going to go ahead and write output to RAM1 and then output the decimal display. So output, IO output is opcode 9, and it's 9 this way, and then decimal display is that operation's ID. All right, so for the next line of code, we are going to flush the output register, and I think that is opcode 8. I am not too sure, so let's go ahead and check. Um, Whenever I check here, you always can check in your uh, the dock instead. It, it's basically the same thing. It has all these IDs in there as well. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, it is seven instead of eight. So we will put seven in here, and we will go ahead and flush the output register, which is ID one. I am pretty sure. If if um, you're not unsure, but if you're unsure about your code, um. You can just go ahead and program it anyway, and then debug, and then when you're debugging, you'll be able to see if um, your code is programmed right or not. And then if not, just turn the computer off, change it, and then turn it back on, and then see the results. So now this is flushing the output register, which means we are clearing the value, the output from the add command from the master output bus, which means we can do more, uh, do other commands. And let's see here, the next line of code add RAM address 1 to RAM address 2 again and then we will go ahead and enable dual read mode so enable dual read mode we have our add opcode and then RAM address 1 and RAM address 2 to add alright for the next instruction here um, we are going to write output to RAM 2 this time and then output the decimal display so output I think is what's the opcode uh, 9 so then I'll go 9 and then decimal display, select it using the operations ID of 1. And now we're going to be running to RAM address 2 instead of RAM address 1. That's pretty much the only difference between this instruction and then um, I think it's this one right here. Yeah, the, these two instructions. And the reason we do that is so that we are able to um, add the previous two numbers together and then still have it work the way the Fibonacci sequence would work. All right. So, and then after that, the next instruction, 
we are going to go ahead and flush the output register again. So we will flush like this and then flush output register. And now um, in the doc it says to loop back, but then we'll go go to's after. But it says on line 18, we will go ahead and shut down the computer. So this is line 18. And this can be anywhere else you want it to be as well. It doesn't really matter. But since it says that in the program, I'm just going to pretty much copy what the program says. So 1, 8, and then 3. So, oops. So this is 11 on core 2. And then that is pretty much it for um, the main instruction. And now we will go ahead and um, program our go to's in and then debug. All right, so we are back and uh, let's go ahead and begin debugging. Uh, no, not debugging. Go ahead and um, programming our go to in here. So I think this is go to false, the magenta. Let's go ahead and take a look. Yep, okay. So on line one of code, remember, we don't have to do anything to actually um, read from line one of code since it's automatically done by the computer when the computer starts. So on line one, we want to go to line two, which is, okay, so that is two. And then for on instruction two, we want to go to instruction three. And then on instruction three, we want to go to instruction four. And then we have a... Um, uh, an if statement here, as some people like to, as some people like to call it, or um, as I will reference them, conditional branches. Um, so we have for f, if shift overflow equals false, then jump to five. If it's true, then jump to eighteen. So this is just a shift overflow check. So we would have put line of code five in here, and then eighteen. Let's just make sure these are right. Okay, so that's one. And let's see, here's five. So two and sixteen for eighteen. And then I think this is. Oops, I fell. Um, all right, so this is one, so you'll be able to do that. Since usually in most of my computers, shift overflow is um, ID number one of the condition tests. Um, oh boy, it's so packed in there. All right. Yes, shift overflow is always mostly number one. So let's go ahead and go back in here. And that was our um, if statement or conditional branch. And then for the next line of code, line five, we want to go to line 6, which is 4 and 2 in binary. Then on line 6, we want to go to line 7. And then on line 7, we have another conditional branch, which is basically the same thing as line 4. So except if shift overflow is false, then we'll jump to 8. And then if it's true, then jump to 18. So let's see here. False is 8. True is 18. And then we're testing for shift overflow again. So it is the condition test ID of 1. And then on line of code 8, we will go to line of code 9, which is 8 and 1 in binary. And then on line of code 9, we are going to go ahead and go to line 4. So this should be right. Yeah, okay. So this will basically, once we hit this line of code here, we will jump back to line 4, which is right here. And then basically just keep on looping through until we hit one of those conditions that we've, um, that we've programmed in. And I actually think that is the entire program programmed. And I went kind of fast, but that is because I'm expecting you guys to know, or mostly know, um, how to program the basics of this computer. I'm just showing you guys some features that might have been um, um, not included in that last video, like some of the commands and stuff, and some advanced programming or intermediate programming. So now that we've programmed our program in, now it is the time to test, our, uh, set up our computer and test our program. All, all right, so now we are at the top here of our um, computer, the, the main control panel. And we're gonna go ahead and wanna change some settings. So I'm gonna leave all of this the same like it was in the tutorial video. But instead of core one toggle, we're gonna turn core one off and then turn core two on. And then I'll go ahead and bring on my F3 debug screen here. And the reason for this is because we have programmed our um, program, our Fibonacci sequence program, on Core 2. So we need to make sure that Core 2 is enabled for um, the computer to run instructions on it. All right. So now that we've done that, we should be able to um, begin testing our program. All right, so I am here in the debugger center, and we'll go ahead and uh, manual power on the computer. We'll wait a little bit for the computer to turn on. 
or quote unquote turn on and um, yes line one of code is being loaded in as you can see by the that line of redstone turning off and now just for simplicity's sake I'm gonna go ahead and use this I, I mainly use the command instead of the button because I like flying around and seeing um, what the computer is doing so I'll go ahead and paste that in and we should be um, since line one of code is being run now um, we should be writing 0 to RAM address 1. So let's go ahead and check RAM address 1 here. And as you can see by this redstone line being on, we are reading, we are writing to RAM 1 and we are writing 0. As you can see, this is completely blank, which is good, which means it is working the way it should. Now I'm going to go ahead and increment the line of code and we should be reading to RAM 2, or writing to RAM 2 now, sorry. And as you can see, we are writing a 1, which is good. Now for our next line of code, we are going to make sure that it is outputting um, RAM address 1, which is 0, which is honestly completely redundant, but um, that's what the program says, and I was kind of um, not really thinking about it when I wrote it, so. Um, so that should be working fine. Let's see if it's reading out properly. I mean, it should be. It doesn't, it's nothing to worry about anyway. So I won't even worry about that. And this is the wrong core to look at anyway, so wouldn't even be right if I did. Okay. So now next line of code, we will go ahead and add our two addresses in memory, which is RAM zero, RAM one and RAM two. And if we go ahead and go to the core two ALU, which should be down here, I think. Yep. Down here, just way down here. Um, as you can see, we are outputting a one. Uh, from the alien. This is the alien output, by the way, just so that you get more familiar with the computer since you want to be at least somewhat familiar with the computer as you program it. So let's see. So that is that. So it is looks like we are adding properly. And when we're testing um, operations from the ALU, you want to look at the output from the ALU, not the master output bus, because you can get confused pretty easily by the fact that um, sometimes the input um, also is pushed onto the master output bus as well. So sometimes this um, the output won't be won't look right, but it actually is um, hardware hardware wise. So that is the add command and is working well. And we are jumping to line five of code. Um, yes. Okay. So we are jumping to line five, which means our condition so far is working since we have not sh hit a shift overflow yet. So on our next line of code. We're going to go ahead and write output to RAM 1 and then output to decimal display. And as you can see, the output to decimal display part is working since we're getting a 1 on our screen there. And we should be writing output to RAM 1, which we are. Okay. So that is good. Next line of code, we will go ahead and flush the output register. Oh boy, that lag. I apologize for that lag. That was so bad. Okay, let's go ahead and try to shake off the lag a little bit. There we go. Okay. Oh boy, that lag is real. Alright, so now this um, ALU output from ALU2, which is from core 2, should be off and empty. Yep, it is, which is good. Now we're going to be adding RAM address 1 and RAM address 2, which is 1 plus 1. And we should get a 2 from here. Uh, yes, we do. We, we have a 2, which is good, and which means it's working right. And as you can see, the reason why I say to look at the ALU output and not the master output bus output is because, as you can see here, the master output bus is reporting a 3 instead of a 2. But we this command is working properly because we have our ALU output here, and then the input is just simply being moved, um, pushed onto the master output bus as well. All right, next line of code. We will write output to RAM 2 and output to decimal display. And we should have done that jump. All right, yep. So we haven't jumped um, with the conditional branch. So it looks like it's working so far. And we should have a 2 on the screen. Yes, OK. I mean, it's working well. And now we will go ahead and load the next line of code, which is flushing the output register. And if we go down here, as you can see, it is all clear, which means it has been flushed successfully. And um, let's make sure we are jumping back to line four of code. I know. Wiggle my way down here. All right. So as you can see, line four is looking like the next line of code to load, which is good. 
and we'll go ahead and load the next line of code in, which is line four, which is adding RAM address one and address two together again. And as you can see here, we are getting a three, which is good since, since it is two plus one. And it looks like it is working since we have looped through it once and everything has worked in there. So I'm going to go ahead and actually, um, uh, hmm, how should I do this? Um, hmm. Okay, so I will go ahead and actually, um, hmm, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and actually test this program. I know we have not debugged the, the conditional branches yet, but we're going to do that when we actually run the program which um, like running the program automatically and then we'll run it at a, um, a slow clock speed so that we'll be able to see if it works or not and sometimes you can debug it that way other times you can debug it manually like I'm like we're doing right now um, there's a lot of uh, a few a few different ways to debug programs using this computer and all of them are acceptable methods so I'm going to go ahead and um, reset our program here and go ahead and prepare it to run automatically from the control panel up there. Alright guys, I am back up here at the um, main control panel. I have reset the core that we were working with and I'm going to go ahead and begin executing this program using the clock here. So I'm going to go ahead and run it at 90 ticks um, just because uh, to see if everything's working right. And now, in my honest opinion, 90 ticks I think is a good little sweet spot in between um, or not really a sweet spot, but it's like a really good spot for um, one of the faster speeds. One of yeah, one of the faster speeds for uh, I think one of the fastest speeds for getting the conditional branching to work, which I know is ridiculously slow. But then again, this is just a prototype and um, somewhat fast. Not really, but 90 ticks is usually what I'll go for when I begin executing programs like this. So we will go ahead and it's like everything is working right. We'll go ahead and turn the computer on and now I'll go ahead and look up here at our indicator and as you can see only um, core 2's uh, program uh, not client of code indicator is working here since um, since that's the only core that's been enabled so as you can see we have um, we are going to line 2 of code and now we are going to line 3 of code so line 2 of code is executing so yeah, that's the kind of confusing thing about this. Whenever you see anything on here, it's the line of code before that that the computer is actually running. So we will just wait for something to happen on the screen, and this may take a little while. So I'm probably just going to speed it up or just sit here for a second until something comes on the screen. All right. So that actually didn't take very long, so uh, even if the computer is running relatively slow. So as you can see, we have our one here, and if the computer keeps running, and now that it's actually gone through the initialization of the first few instructions and set everything up, and this should go by actually relatively quickly, even though we are running at a 90 tick speed. So let's see here, we have our two and as you can see it was three for a second because of the hardware that all right guys so um, the computer here is just about to throw a ship to overflow error as it goes 144 and then I think 233 and then it should shift to overflow and then shut down so let's go ahead and wait for it to update here all right I'm gonna go ahead and cut into the video a little bit um, this is editing Duncan here instead of um, uh, tutorial Duncan teaching everybody how to program this computer um, I uh, when I was editing this uh, video for the Fibonacci sequence uh, video which this should be in um, I was determined to figure out why this um, the shift overflow light didn't turn on when uh, we went ahead and uh, had a shift overflow branch uh, test and um, turns out that right around here there were a bunch of missing blocks and redstone wires and stuff and the signal was coming through here but there was no wire here like right around here for it to go all the way up so I have uh, 
uh, therefore I fix this problem and this uh, update will be uh, in the uh, official uh, Redstone computer world download so I will go ahead and make sure to update the world download so that this is included in there so back to your video and since we have our um, clear uh, no, report exceptions to IO we should see um, 233 as you can see we should see uh, this light turn on and if it does, then that means that the computer has um, detected a shift overflow and it should shut down if everything is set up properly. And then if it's not, we'll see that since the computer will continue running instead of um, shutting down or if we didn't program the branch right. But let's hope this light turns on. And okay. So I think, yeah, okay. So it did turn off and it looks like did not output but it did turn off which means that it did recognize the branch huh that's weird but okay so it did work and we know that our program fully works now which is good and so that is pretty much the Fibonacci program um, programmed into this computer um, if you guys have any questions about um, this program or anything else in general please let me know um, I'm, here to, I'm here to help you guys program this but um, until next time, guys, uh, I'll see you later. Bye-bye.